Good afternoon, everybody. We're excited to bring you uh, Neurocritical Care Pharmacy Journal Club for the month of October. Um, we've got two presenters today, um, Dr. Madeline Mitchell and Dr. Carrie Jones. So we will start with uh, Madeline, if you wanna share your slides. Okay, we can see your slides. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Thank you so much everyone for joining. I'm really excited to speak with you today. I'll be presenting a new piece of evidence for a seizure prophylaxis after intracerebral hemorrhage, which will be a review of the recently published PEACH trial. Intracerebral hemorrhage, or ICH as I'll be referring to it during the presentation, occurs when a blood vessel ruptures inside the brain and causes bleeding within the cerebral tissues. Patients may present with the hallmark sign of a worse headache of their life, one-sided deficits, or altered mental status. They're often diagnosed with imaging like a CT or an MRI. Based on location of the bleed within the cerebral tissues, ICH can be further categorized as either low bar or deep. Low bar would refer to a bleed occurring within the low bar tissues, of course, or the cortex, and then a deep bleed would occur in the deep structures of the brain, including the thalamus, basal ganglia, or brainstem. The location itself may also help elucidate the cause of the bleed, with low bar bleeds being more associated with cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and then the deep ICH is being more associated with hypertension. Unfortunately, the, this disease state specifically does come with a relatively high risk of mortality, around 40%. And additionally, survivors of the disease have a 60 to 80% risk of a functional deficit after their acute presentation. These patients may also experience clinical seizures between 10 and 15%. And subclinical seizures occur more frequently in around a third of patients with ICH. The seizures themselves can be further categorized as early, occurring within 7 to 14 days of the ICH, or late, occurring greater than 7 to 14 days after the initial bleed. Due to this risk of seizures, anti-seizure medication or anti-seizure prophylaxis can be used to prevent this complication. Current practice based off a recent survey of our clinicians indicates their use for about 20% of these patients. Based off this survey, several factors have been associated with the initiation of anti-seizure meds or ASMs for prophylaxis. These factors do somewhat correlate with factors associated with poor functional outcome defined as a modified ranking scale of four to six. Young age, low bar ICH, craniotomy, prior ICH, as well as a high NAHSS score are associated with the initiation of anti-seizure medications. Somewhat likewise, factors associated with poor prognosis include high ICH, poor functional baseline, larger bleeds, and subarachnoid or intraventricular extensions. Anti-seizure medications are used in ICH patients most obviously to prevent seizures, but it's also important to understand the downstream consequences that seizures may have for these patients specifically. So theoretically, seizures may cause variability in blood pressure, increases in the intracerebral pressure, and a renal death from the damage of the bleed itself. They have therefore been associated with negative outcomes, including ICH expansion and midline shift, as well as some association with negative functional outcomes. There's also been reports of increased hospital length of stay after seizures occur for these patients, and some, albeit weak, evidence shows an increased risk of mortality as well for seizures. So it's relatively clear that this complication has high consequences for these patients, but only 20% of them really do receive anti-seizure prophylaxis, as we discussed from the survey. So why might that be? Our guideline recommendations don't, don't make a strong stance, but generally don't recommend anti-seizure prophylaxis. So the European Society recommended in 2014 that there's insufficient evidence for anti-seizure prophylaxis after ICH 
for the prevention of seizures or for the improvement of long-term functional outcomes. The AHA earlier this year published guidelines, again, encouraging treatment for clinical seizures or EEG seizures when they are detected, but ultimately recommending against prophylactic anti-seizure medications with the caveat that this is from no benefit due to non-randomized data. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the literature that went into these guidelines before jumping into our article of interest today at the Peach Trail. So these are some studies that looked at ICH and seizure prophylaxis for spontaneous ICH patients. So starting from the top, the Natick trial in 2009 was a prospective observational trial with 98 patients looking at those that received either Keppra or phenytoin for prophylaxis or seizure. They found in their conclusions that phenytoin had a reduced NIHSS score at day 14, but had increased number of febrile days. The MESSI trial published in the same year looked at patients from the placebo arm of the previously published CHANT trial. This is 300 patients who received any kind of anti-seizure medication, and they ultimately concluded that the use of anti-seizure medications led to a poor functional outcome. The GLAD trial in 2011 was our first and only RCT of this group. It was 72 patients randomized to receive val valproic acid or placebo. They found no difference in mortality. However, they did see a trend toward reduced early seizures versus late seizures. The BATI trial in 2012 was a retrospective cohort with about 1,100 patients who received anti-seizure prophylaxis with the three agents listed there, phenytoin, kephra, or valproic acid. And they found a reduced mortality in low bar ICH specifically and specifically in the group that received kephra. The Mackey trial in 2017 was a retrospective review with 500 patients who received Keppra specifically and found no effect on mortality or on functional outcome for these patients. Last but not least, the Savalia trial in, published earlier this year as well was a respect, prospective case control cohort from the ERIC trial, about 1,600 patients with intracerebral hemorrhage and they found ultimately no difference in mortality, functional outcome, or seizure occurrence in these patients. So you can see the data is somewhat mixed. So a systematic review was published by Gigliotti and colleagues in 2021 and to review the effect of anti-seizure meds on seizure occurrence and in clinical and functional outcomes. They included seven studies. Four out of the seven studies included had the majority of their patients receive Keppra for their anti-seizure medication. 4,000 patients in total were analyzed, of which only 35% actually received an anti-seizure medication, and even more so, 20% received Keppra specifically. As you can see, poor functional outcome occurred more frequently in the anti-seizure group and specifically in those patients that received the Keppra, they had statistically significant increased risk of poor functional outcome as well. On the other hand, there was no statistical significance in the difference of seizure occurrence or mortality. Authors of this study did note that their data was limited by confounding of indication, misclassification bias due to variability in seizure monitoring using either clinical seizures or EEG seizures, and survival bias, of course, as well. Also, it's important to note that really only 35% of the patients in the whole population received anti-seizure meds, so this is a small cohort. So now that we reviewed some of the background literature around SI, ICH and anti-seizure prophylaxis, I wanted to jump into the PEACH trial. This was published last month in Lancet Neurology. This was a randomized, double-blind, parallel group placebo-controlled, investigator-led phase three trial with an aim to determine the impact of prophylactic anti-seizure drugs on the risk of early seizures in acute ICH. The authors of this trial defined early seizures as those occurring within seven days of the bleed. It was conducted in three hospitals in France, specifically in stroke units. And the dosing protocol they used was Keppra 500 milligrams started as an IV and transition to PO once patients were cleared by speech therapists. That was concluded or continued at full dose for 30 days. And patients underwent a two-week taper, which included Keppra 250, Q12 for seven days, 
and then followed by 250Q24 for seven days, and then it was stopped. The monitoring parameters used throughout the study are shown in the bottom row of this chart. Of note, CT or MRI was used to diagnose these patients and then for follow-up imaging at 72 hours, as well as EEGs being started within 24 hours of admission and continued for 48 hours. This is a pictorial representation of the monitoring parameters that I just went over, um, but more clearly it shows that patients were diagnosed at time zero, included and randomized to receive Keppra or placebo. The EEG had to be started within 24 hours of their presentation and then continued for 48 hours until day three or 72 hours after their presentation, at which point a CT was done for follow-up imaging. And you can see their secondary outcomes listed on the top half of the picture until 12 months where the study concluded. Adults with spontaneous supertentorial ICH diagnosed on imaging who presented within 24 hours of their symptom onset were included in the trial. Those excluded were NAHSS score greater than 25, traumatic ICH, hemorrhagic transformation of an ischemic stroke, those already taking anti-seizure medications, and other groups that are listed on the right-hand side. Primary outcome for this trial was the occurrence of greater than or equal to one clinical or electrographic seizure within 72 hours of inclusion. The authors of this trial defined a seizure on EEG as a rhythmic discharge lasting greater than or equal to 10 seconds with abrupt onset and termination. Secondary efficacy outcomes of interest included number and duration of seizures on the EEG, change in the NIHSS score, change in the modified Rankin scale, stroke impact scale, and change in hemorrhag hemorrhagic volume and mass effect. Secondary safety outcomes that the authors investigated included side effects related to the treatment, which is Keppra, the hospital anxiety and depression scale, and of course, all-cause mortality. It was calculated that 52 patients were needed per group for 80% power. Authors of the study assumed a seizure rate in the placebo group of 35%, and a seizure rate in the Kepper group of 10% with a loss to follow-up of 10%. They used a modified attention to treat analysis, which included all patients randomized who had the continuous EEG completed for 48 hours. Overall, 50 patients were enrolled. Therefore, this study clearly did not meet their power calculation. You can see 24 patients were randomized to receive Kepra and 26 were randomized to receive the placebo. 23 were included in the safety analysis for Keppra and 25 for the placebo group. At baseline, the groups did have some differences, although no statistics were performed on these. You can see on average patients in the Keppra group were 10 years older. Likewise, they had um, six patients in each group had intraventricular extension. More patients in the placebo group had a deep location for their ICH, and they also had larger volumes of ICH at baseline, almost double that of the placebo group at nine mLs. You can see also that the delay between their symptoms and EEG initiation was about 25 hours for both groups, and the delay between their symptoms and the initiation of treatment was 19 hours for the Kepa group and 14 hours for the placebo group. Of note, in both groups, these patients were for the most part neurologically intact with a median GCS score of 15. Patients in both groups had good follow-up for about one year, which was the intention of this trial, and 75% had good compliance without interruption of their Keppra during the full dose and the taper um, for the duration of the trial as well. These are the results for their primary outcome, which is incidence of clinical or continuous EEG seizure at 72 hours. You can see statistical significance was found in the difference between seizures with three patients in the Kepa group and 10 patients in the placebo group experiencing a seizure. There was also statistically significant reduction in the number of seizures seen on continuous EEG specifically and in the duration of seizures itself on the EEG. There were no clinical seizures observed, however, in either group 
for any patients. Similarly, there was no difference seen in any of the functional outcomes investigated by these authors. While change in NIHSS score at 72 hours and three months did favor the Kepa group, this is not statistically significant. And change in ICH volume favored Kepra, whereas midline shift favored the placebo group. From a safety perspective, there was no difference in serious adverse events for either group. The hospital anxiety and depression scale favored the Kepra group at one month, but ultimately did not show a difference. And there was no difference in all-cause mortality. The authors ultimately concluded that the study was underpowered. However, they did find statistical significance in their primary outcome, and therefore concluded that Kepra was safe and showed possible efficacy at preventing occurrence of seizure after spontaneous ICH. They did note significant difficulties with this study and its completion due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the withdrawal and cessation of their funding. Study, of course, has its strengths and weaknesses. This was a well-designed, randomized prospective trial with robust considerations and time points for their clinical outcomes and secondary efficacy and safety outcomes. The patients also had high compliance around 75% and achieved long-term follow-up, which was intended for this trial to be at one year. On the other hand, this trial was clearly limited by its small sample size of around 50 patients, had to be prematurely terminated due to the cessation of funding, as I mentioned. Their power calculation assumptions maybe overestimated the incidence of seizure in the placebo group and underestimated the incidence of seizure in the Kepra group compared to a lot of the background information that we went over previously. Um, however, this is sort of a moot point as they obviously did not meet their power. We spoke previously about the imbalanced baseline characteristics, including age, baseline hematoma volume, and deep or, or low bar location of the bleed, which would all be very important confounding factors for the risk of seizures for these patients. Furthermore, there was no standardization of the type of imaging used at 72 hours for follow-up. Either CT or MRI could be used, which could be um, problematic for investigating outcomes like the hematoma volume, midline shift, and other bleed parameters looking um, at the follow-up time point. No video EEG was used, so it would be impossible to clinically correlate what was seen on the EEG to what was seen um, actually in the patients. So this would be problematic for those. And then in looking at our continuous EEG specifically, it was only used for 48 hours after the inclusion and the protocol determined that it must be started within 24 hours. So while logistically that likely allowed more patients to be included since they needed time to set up an EEG and get these patients you know, randomized to each of their groups, they did likely miss a lot of the seizures that were occurring for these patients as most trials and information that I saw reported the majority of seizures occurring within 24 hours of the injury. There was always also fixed dosing used for the Kepra with no adjustment for renal function and the duration of the Kepra itself was prolonged compared to many of the other studies in this area with six weeks of Kepra versus maybe seven to 10 days as seen in majority of the other literature. This information also lacks generalizability to severe ICH patients since these patients were not included in the trial. As I mentioned previously, the patients were neurologically intact with a GCS of 15 and overall small hematoma volumes. The type of electrographic seizure was not particularly specified in this um, trial, either in the primary literature or in the supplemental. Um, so it's unclear if these patients, although defined as a seizure by this trial, their definition doesn't match the ACNS recommendation for what defines a seizure. So this would be important in distinguishing different types of seizures or even epileptical discharges for these patients as well. Lastly, there was no comment on patients with craniotomy. It's unlikely that majority of these patients experienced any sort of craniotomy or procedure since they did have majority mild bleeds, um, but it would be an important confounder as that would put patients at increased risk for seizure as well. So this study specified the dosing and duration of Kepra as four weeks with a two-week taper. 
This extended duration of seizure prophylaxis doesn't mirror any of the other studies that have been conducted, which looked at sort of durations, as I mentioned, between seven and 14 days for the majority of the literature. There was imbalance between the groups in ICH location, deep versus low bar, and volumes between the groups, which is an important confounding factor, as we discussed. Overall, I would say this trial is really hypothesis generating, or in this case, hypothesis supporting, um, but doesn't necessarily witness or warrant a practice change due to the majority of the limitations that we discussed. It does add limited evidence in support of Capra use after ICH for prophylaxis, really just looking at mild to moderate ICH only, and does leave a bit to be desired for the ideal duration and patient population that would benefit most from seizure prophylaxis. In summary, Keppra is a safe option for seizure prophylaxis after ICH for short-term use between one and six weeks looking at the literature and shows a relatively benign adverse event profile. However, its efficacy as seen in this trial leaves a bit to be desired. Specifically, it has limited applicability due to, for our general practice, due to small sample size and imbalanced groups as we discussed, and they used only short-term EEG monitoring. And like I mentioned before, I wouldn't change my practice based off this trial, and I wouldn't go out of my way to ensure that every patient um, with an SICH would receive Keppra for prophylaxis. In the future, it would be useful to see an adequately powered RCT with early initiation of a continuous EEG with video monitoring as well for patients with low bar ICH. And I think that's really the next step as we look for the best patient population and duration for, these, for this uh, disease state. Here are the sources I use for this presentation. And I'd be happy to open the floor for discussion and questions. Thank you, Madeline. That was a great job with your presentation and pointing out some of the limitations to this trial. I suspect we're going to have lots of great conversation about this trial. Um, one thing I was just going to start off with was to ask you what your thoughts are on the dosing of the Keppra, as you mentioned, and what your institution currently practices in terms of using prophylactic anticonvulsants after spontaneous ICH. Yeah, so our current practice um is that the majority of patients do not receive any anti-seizure prophylaxis. Um, and speaking with majority of our neuro-focused clinicians and um, some of our attending physicians, our general practice is not to prescribe anti-seizure prophylaxis for these patients. However, we do have um, several that have the opinion that low bar hemorrhages with large volumes may benefit from anti-seizure prophylaxis and that has been um, the practice for those patients in our neuro ICU. And specifically looking at the dosing, I think um, the majority of patients would, would qualify to receive Keppra at 500 uh, BID. So I think that's, that's not necessarily wrong for the trial um, to sort of prescribe these patients, um, but it's interesting that they didn't account for, you know, differences in renal function if that were applicable. Yeah, that's a good point. I think, you know, it would have been helpful to know the weight of these patients too, um, just depending on their weight or BMI, you know, you may, may want to use more um, than 500 BID. So just things to think about. Yeah, that's a good point. Other questions for Madeline? Um, it looks like Madeline, there is one in the chat here. Uh, it looks like Andy Webb had a question. Was the primary outcome adjusted for the baseline imbalances? specifically looking at the location and size of hematoma? Um, not to my knowledge, no, which would have been uh, really helpful. Okay, it looks like, um, Kent, did you wanna verbally ask your question? Hey, Colleen, thank you. Yeah, I, I can do that if it's easier. So it really relates to the selection of anti-seizure uh, agent of choice. We know agents like phenytoin or phenobar historically have been associated with worse, worse outcomes. And some of the data you presented, majority of the patients are supposed to come. Also in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage, we know that's not an ideal uh, drug of choice. How would you kind of think about selection of um, anti-seizure drug uh, in the setting of ICH 
uh, in light of this uh, new clinical uh, trial? Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with everything you said. Um, so I think that if a provider came to me and asked me, you know, I really want to do anti-seizure prophylaxis for this patient. I don't know what agent to use. What would you recommend? Um, and I think my answer really would be Keppra for these patients. Like you mentioned, a lot of the previous literature has shown negative outcomes with phenytoin or phenobarb um, and kind of mixed data on valproic acid as well. So what we see from this trial and a lot of the other data that's looked at Keppra is that it really doesn't have a detrimental adverse effect profile. Um, and I think for that reason, its safety would really be the reason that I would choose it. Okay, Madeline, it looks like there's another question in the chat from Corinne Berger. Um, given the prolonged duration of seizure prophylaxis and possible benefits seen in this study, um, despite the obvious many limitations, how would you convince a provider not to use this protocol based on the positive findings of the study? Yeah, I think that's a good, a good question. And I would really pose the question of, you know, if someone came to me and said, well, the PEACH trial showed benefit with Keppra. Um, you know, what do you think about that? And I would really question, well, did it really show a benefit? Because this was, this was clinical or EEG seizure, and they only saw a difference in EEG seizure. Um, and this definition of seizure is different from what a lot of other trials are using and what the ACNS defines a seizure as. Um, and I think that, you know, patients that were included in this trial as having an EEG seizure within 72 hours, um, you know, maybe didn't actually have true epileptic seizures um, based off of the ACNS definition of seizure. So I think while technically the trial did show benefit in their primary outcome with, with EEG seizures being reduced, there was no difference in clinical seizures and the time point just really missed the majority of seizures that we know occur in this, these patients within 24 hours. Thank you, Madeline. Are there any other questions for Madeline? Hey, Madeline, it's Gabe. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, so I just tossed it into the chat, but I'll just say it verbally. Um, so in this kind of um, piggybacks on Corinne's question, would you absolutely prevent and argue against using uh, leptiracetam in these patients if your provider felt compelled to prescribe it? Or would you say, you know what, the risk benefit ratio, there's really not a lot of risk here. So if you're truly interested in it, here you go. Or is there a patient population that you would say, no, absolutely not. I'm going to fight this tooth and nail and you are not going to give this patient Keppra. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like kind of the first option of what you presented is, is how I would approach it for the majority of patients with you know, there's really not a lot of risk as we've seen from, from the literature that we've discussed and maybe some benefit. So I think it, you know, if someone came to me and really wanted to use it, I would probably allow that to happen. Verify the order, I suppose. Madeline, it looks like one more last comment um, from Andy Webb is one other way to think about it is if a patient is found to have the continuous EEG findings, the trial defined as a seizure, would you initiate seizure treatment? It's a really hard question without seeing or specifying the rhythm or the type of seizure, um, because this definition of seizure excludes and includes different patients that maybe we wouldn't treat with an anti-seizure medication without clinical correlation. So I think without more information, you would have to treat it as a seizure because we don't, we don't know. Um, but I think that information of really what's going on, um, let me see the EEG or let me look at the patient um, would be really helpful in determining that. 
Thank you. And just to be clear, the seizures that were seen in the study were all electrographic seizures? Yes, these were all electrographic seizures. No clinical seizures were seen in either group. Thank you. Any last questions for Madeline? Okay, thank you, very nice job. Thank you, everyone. We will transition to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Carrie Jones is from Grady Health System. She's a PGY2 neurology resident, and I will let you go ahead and share your screen and get started whenever you're ready. Absolutely, thank you. Can you see that okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so my name, like she said, is Carrie Jones. I'm going to be talking to you today about um, effects of intravenous tyrophibine versus placebo before endovascular thrombectomy on functional outcomes in large vessel occlusion strokes. This is also known uh, more commonly and a little easier to say as the Rescue BT randomized clinical trial. And this was published August 9th of 2022 in JAMA. So I'm going to say a little bit of background before we get started into our trial, and then we'll talk a lot, a little bit of literature, and then I'll hop into our trial. So unsuccessful reperfusion in endovascular therapy can be secondary to traumatic damage to vascular endothelium with subendothelial matrix exposure. This injury to the endothelial cells during thrombectomy can cause platelet activation as well as aggregation and can result in early reocclusion and an unsuccessful reperfusion during an EBT. Glycoprotein 2B3A antagonists are effective antiplatelet agents that have been shown in literature um, as promising agents for prevention of thrombotic complications during PCI, specifically in our acute coronary syndromes. Um, our three agents that are considered as a glycoprotein 2B3A antagonist are tyrofiban, which will be the focus of today's presentation, as well as eptifibotide and abciximab. Um, so there are three different agents that will briefly touch on all three of them, but we will focus mainly on the tyrofiban. Um, there, overall, there are really decent studies that look at these agents for PCI, um, but as far as moving them into the realm of acute ischemic stroke patients, um, there's not as much literature surrounding that. So we'll start our presentation with the literature review, um, touching on trials that assess not only the tyrofiban, but also some of the other agents in the class as well. So the first trial we will briefly touch on is the SATIS trial. Um, this was published in Stroke in 2011. This specifically looked at safety of tyrofiban versus placebo in our acute ischemic stroke population. It looked at 260 individuals. Um, what this trial found was the rate of cerebral hemorrhage transformation, as well as the parenchymal hemorrhage, was overall similar. However, our mortality over five months decreased, um, did have a significant change. Our second trial that we'll just briefly touch on is the also published in Stroke, and this was published in 2023. Um, this was Keller and colleagues. Um, this looked at our um, spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, which I have abbreviated all these throughout, um, so I'll just refer to that as SICH. So this looks specifically at SICH um, compared to placebo in patients who received EVT. Um, what this trial found was that terofiban did not influence our recanalization rates, and it actually statistically increased our fatal intracranial hemorrhage, as well as our modified Rankine scale. Um, and there was a non-statistical um, increase in our SICH. Um, a couple of things I just want to briefly point out about these trials um, and a big takeaway that you're going to kind of see a theme through the next couple of trials we talk about is although we're talking about acute ischemic stroke patients here, these patients are not um, being administered a thrombolytic. So both of these trials, as well as the next few that we talk about, the patients were either out of the window for a thrombolytic or they were not administered one. Um, third trial that we will briefly talk about was also published in Stroke. This one was in 2017. 
And this looked again at SICH and Aturofaban versus placebo. Um, and this was in, in 180 different individuals. Um, so this found a similar SICH rate and overall decreased early reocclusion with a tyrofiban. This was not statistically significant, however, um, but any um, intracranial hemorrhage, fatal intracranial hemorrhage, and three-month modified Rankin was not statistically significant. Fourth one we'll briefly discuss was an 11-study meta-analysis. Um, this one was published in 2020, and it looked at about 2,000 patients, um, 2,028 to be specific, um, biggest takeaway from this one was our SICH was not increased with our Turofaban group. Um, so overall, they were right at 11.4, 11.5%. Um, and our pooled analysis did show that the Turofaban did not increase the risk of SICH in these patients. Um, they also did a um, pool analysis as well on mortality in this patient population, and the tyrofiban um, did show that it can significantly reduce our mortality. Um, something else that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned you might have noticed in the first two trials versus these two, the first two had more of an increase of um, our intracranial hemorrhage rate compared to our more recent ones. Um, so something that I did want to address was this could have been a result of the individuals in the trials using older thrombectomy devices compared to some of the stent receivers that we started using after 2015. So these trials would have been completed after um, some of our newer technology. The last study that we will briefly discuss as part of our background um, was another meta-analysis. This one assessed 20 studies, and this one's a little different than the other ones that only looked at the tyrofiban. This specifically looked at our um, ICH risk in all of our GP2B3A receptor antagonists. So this did include the eptifibotide, abcixumab, and tyrofiban. Um, it did include doses as well for your reference. There is not a lot of data, um, unfortunately, on dosing in this um, population. Um, the majority of our dosing does from, come from a cardiac perspective, more so than a neurology. Um, so the tyrofiban in this patient population is a range, um, and it's a little different in each of the studies that was previously discussed. Um, so overall, table four comes directly from the meta-analysis itself. And so this one is saying um, overall that there's convincing evidence that the abcixumab enhances the risk of SICH when used for acute ischemic stroke treatment and prevention of artery reocclusion. Um, however, the eptifibotab as well as the tyrofibane could be promising therapeutic agents in this patient population. Um, looking specifically at our pooled relative risk value for SICH, um, it was 1.78 in our randomized controlled trials and then 1.16 in our analysis for all types of studies. So this does suggest that potentially our GP2B3A receptor antagonists could induce um, SICH. Um, I will point out that the tyrofiban um, did include one in its CI interval, so that was not statistically significant. So potentially this could be a promising agent in this study. Um, and overall, the eptifibotab as well as the tyrofiban are both smaller uh, molecules in this class, and so potentially their risk of intracranial hemorrhage could be considered as more of a neutral or decreased compared to the abcixumab. Um, a couple other things that I briefly wanted to point out as some background um, is that the mortality column on the right side. Um, so it does appear that the tyrofiban has an advantage with mortality in this analysis. However, overall, they're just based on this one meta analysis, it does look like eptifibotab as well as the tyrofiban are promising agents for acute ischemic stroke. Um, like I mentioned, I am going to just focus on the one agent. But one other thing that I did want to briefly throw out um, and a reason that maybe we're not talking as much about eptifibotab as some of the other agents is that um, agent is actually not marketed in the United States any longer. Um, so we are going to briefly talk about 
um, this trial, um, get into this a little bit more. So just a reminder of what exactly we're talking about. Um, the study looks specifically at the efficacy and adverse events of IV tyrofiban initiated before intravascular thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke, secondary to large vessel occlusion. My study was an investigator-initiated multi-center one-to-one randomized trial. Um, the one-to-one -one randomization was also stratified by the stroke severity. Um, so patients who had an NIH of less than or equal to 17 compared to greater than 17, um, the occlusion site, so whether they were an internal carotid artery occlusion or not, and the participating center. And it was also decided upon a block side of block size of four. The study design was also double-blinded and placebo-controlled, and it was multi-center um, across 55 hospitals in China. They specifically recruited between October 10th of 2018 and October 31st of 2021, with the final follow-up on January 15th of 2022. Regarding their study design and intervention, our total amount of patients that were um, randomized were 948, and the investigators had 463 in the tyrofiban arm and 485 in placebo. Um, patients did receive a bolus dose of 10 micrograms per kilogram, followed by continuous infusion of 0 0.15 microgram per kilogram per minute for up to 24 hours, regardless if they receive placebo or tyrofiban. Um, and the patients did also receive rapid endovascular treatment. Um, there was also an option to receive a rescue therapy as well. If the patients initially received tyrofiban, they would receive placebo and vice versa. Regarding our endpoints, our primary endpoints, the first one was an efficacy endpoint. This looked at level of global disability at 90 days. And our second primary endpoint was safety. Um, this was symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. Our secondary endpoints were also broken down into clinical efficacy as well as technical efficacy. Um, for clinical efficacy, this was patients without disability or who returned to their pre-morbid modified Rankin score at 90 days. Um, just as a really brief reminder of a modified Rankin score, that is a scale from zero to six, with one being highly functional and six being the patient has expired. So patients, um, one of these efficacy was, did they return to their pre-morbid MRS score? Um, patients' functional independence at 90 days was also assessed. Um, if the patient was ambulatory or capable of attending to their bodily needs, um, a change in their NIHSS from baseline to 24 hours, as well as baseline to five to seven days, and then the score of the European quality of life, five dimension, five level scale. Um, and our technical efficacy secondary endpoints were the proportion of patients with substantial reperfusion at initial pre-perfusion or pre-procedure catheter angiogram, as well as their final angiogram. Um, patients who received the rescue drug and then recanalization as assessed by imaging. Eligibility, our inclusion criteria was patients who presented within 24 hours of time last known well. Um, and patients were also included if they presented with an NIHSS of less than or equal to 30. Um, so another quick reminder about our NIH scale, um, this is a scale of zero to two that quantifies our stroke severity based on weighted evaluation findings. Um, so our patients had to present as a less than or 30 to be included. Um, the aspect score was also an inclusion criteria. Um, patients were included with an aspect score greater than or equal to six. Um, so the aspect score is also a quantitative scale as well. This one is a 10-point scale, and an aspect score of less than or equal to seven predicts a worse functional outcome at three months. Final inclusion criteria the authors included was um, occlusion of the intracranial ICA, or the first or second MCA, as confirmed by imaging. Notably, our patients were excluded if they had received dual antiplatelet within one week, or if they had been given an IV thrombolytic, such as all to place after stroke onset. Statistical analysis for the study, um, there were 930 patients that were required for a 90% power 
to detect a two-sided significance level of 0.05. Um, logistic or linear regression models were used for secondary outcomes, and these specifically were adjusted for patients' age, baseline NIHSS, um, baseline aspects, time from last known well, randomization, and their occlusion site. A walled chai squared test was also used for explanatory variables and multivariable logistics regression, as well as a Kaplan-Meier method and a log rank test assessed mortality. Getting into some of the baseline characteristics, I do want to point out that this um, list of baseline characteristics is not all inclusive. I did select some of the more pertinent ones, um, but all of the baseline characteristics were laid out very well in the trial, if you wanted to reference that. Overall, our, um, because of the randomization process, my baseline characteristics were very similar in both of the arms um, from a demographics, medical history, and a pre-stroke MRS. Um, second slide here of some pertinent baseline characteristics um, is our pre-stroke antithrombotic therapy is the one that I want to point out. Um, so specifically in our exclusion criteria, I did mention that patients on dual time platelet therapy would be excluded. Um, however, in the tyrafiban group, there were 10 or um, approximately 2% of patients that were included on dual antiplatelets. Um, outside of the dual antiplatelets, the majority of the other things were pretty well comparable. Um, the trial did not include p-values on their baseline statistics. Um, getting into how the patients were randomized um, and talking about how the investigators did the study. Um, like I mentioned, there were 463 in the tyro arm, 485 in the placebo. Um, and patients who received placebo but then were administered the tyrofiban as a rescue agent were included um, in the um, as treated analysis for the final analysis of the study. Moving on to the results section of the trial, um, neither of our results here are statistically significant. Um, so our primary outcomes of the modified Rankin at 90 days was three in both of our arms with a range of one to four. And SICH within 48 hours was 9% in the tyrofibin arm compared to 28% in placebo. Breaking down the last slide into just a little bit more of a visually appealing way to look at this, um, I did mention that our 90-day um, MRS was not statistically significant. Um, however, this is just a distribution of the global disability at 90 days based on modified Rankin. Um, this was assessed by outside providers who are trained to look at video evidence of a patient um, to ensure that the modified Rankin scale was appropriate. Um, but overall, very, um, very similar in both the tyrofibin group as well as the placebo group. Getting into our secondary outcome result section, um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is our modified Rankin at 90 days versus baseline. Um, so this is dichotomizing our MRS score. Um, this specifically broke it down zero to one is patients without disability or who return to their pre-morbid MRS. Um, patients who were classified as zero to two had functional independence. So MRS score of zero to two specifically and zero to three were patients who were ambulatory or could carry on um, everyday functions. Overall, neither our MRS at 90 days, our NIHSS, our substantial reperfusion, or our mortality at 90 days, none were statistically significant. I did pull out the two that did show statistical significance, um, just so you can focus on those. The first one was our rescue drug use. Um, so patients who ha were given um, placebo and then required the tyrofiban, um, that was a statistically significant difference um, compared to patients who required placebo during EVT. And then patients with radiologic ICH was also statistically significant, 34.9% in the tyrofiban arm compared to 28% in placebo. Looking a little bit closer at our results section, this is a subgroup analysis that specifically looked at large artery atherostroke etiology. 
Um, so there was a suggestion of possible benefit for the tyrofibin versus placebo in the subgroup. Um, it looked at 435 patients with, sorry, my screens keep skipping, I apologize. Um, but it looked at um, 435 patients, and although the test did yield an interaction p-value of 0 0.09, it was not test technically significant, there was a trend towards significance. Um, if you look at our forest plot here, um, you'll see where our line, um, it doesn't cross one, but it does definitely approach significance. Um, so I do think that that sets the stage for future trials. Looking at what the author concluded about this study, they said that treatment with intravenous tyrofiban compared with placebo before EVT resulted in no sig significant difference in disability severity at 90 days. And overall, their findings did not support use of intravenous tyrofiban before EVT in the acute ischemic stroke population. Um, getting into my critique of the study, um, overall, starting with the strengths, um, this study was designed very well, um, and I think the stratification is definitely a strength of the study. Um, patients were stratified by their stroke severity, as well as the occlusion site and participating center. Um, specifically, I think their participating center stratification is very beneficial to the study, um, specifically because one reason is the heparin um, could be administered during EVT. However, that dose is not standardized across um, different hospitals, so that does account for difference in heparin doses. Um, another reason I think the center stratification is important is because this does take into account the level of skill of the, inter of the individuals who were completing the EVT, as well as the volume that they do at that particular center. Um, the large sample size is also another strength of this trial. Um, and a third strength is dosing of the tyrofiban within the range of previous trials. Um, limitations found in their trial, um, the first one is the administration rate of the bolus. Um, this was not defined throughout the study. The study specifically used a 10 microgram per kilogram bolus, and that was stated. However, there is some um, and none of the supplemental or the study itself does it discuss how quickly this was administered. You can extrapolate that it was likely given over less than five minutes based on how it's given in a cardiac setting. Um, however, there's a saying that the brain bleeds, but the heart doesn't. So that does play into question if the dosing um, and the administration rate of their bolus was appropriate. Um, the study was multi-center, but it was within all of China, which does limit our general ability. Um, and the number of passes is another limitation as well. Um, so the number of passes with thrombectomy devices is not recorded. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, this does increase our endothelial damage potentially as we increase our passes. Um, patients who were included, this did include patients who were on anticoagulation. And specifically, there were also patients who were included on dual antiplatelets in our entire five bank group as well. Um, including patients on anticoagulation, these patients are already at higher risk of bleeding, so that could have played into um, some of the results of the trial. And then the last limitation is enrollment based on the aspect score, um, not specifically a CTEP. So my application to clinical practice, um, terifaban IV should not be routinely administered in acute ischemic stroke patients receiving EVT. Overall, this did not improve the efficacy of EVT, and it could be harmful as shown by our radiologic ICH results. Um, the results of the study are not practice changing, um, and overall, it's not going to impact our practice at my current institution. My takeaway points, overall, the tyrofibin arm had an increased risk for intracranial hemorrhage with a statistically significant p-value, and it also had a trend towards a greater risk of SICH as well. Um, subgroup analysis also observed a trend towards significance for large artery athro, and more trials should investigate this. Um, specifically, as we talked about with the subgroup analysis with the floors plot. Feature considerations. Um, overall, I kind of hit on the tyrofiban and how dosing is not well understood in this patient population. Um, so I do think that this calls into, um, into consideration that we do need some more trials 
on not only the dosing, but also the appropriate dosing of our bolus um, and the, how quickly it should be administered potentially. Um, so a dose finding study and dose duration should be determined. Um, the tyrophiban and large artery atherosclerosis patients should also be assessed. Um, I know that this could be difficult to create and identify these patients up front. So this might potentially have to be a separate group analysis as well. And then there is a lot of talk around these agents in acute ischemic stroke. So in the pipeline, there are quite a few different trials. Um, there is a part two of this trial, the rescue BT part two, looking at non-large vessel occlusive strokes. There's also a trial looking at continuous IV infusion tyrophiban efficacy in acute ischemic stroke, as well as studies that are looking at uh, tyrophiban in combination with alteplase. And the last studies that are starting to pop up is the eftifibotide trials. Specifically at my institution, we are currently enrolling patients for the MOST trial, which is looking at that agent in patients who receive thrombolytics and thrombectomy. So there is a lot in the pipeline for this group of medications, specifically in acute ischemic strokes. And I think there's a lot of promising data that could come out of those. Overall, here are my references, and I would love to take any questions you have. Thank you, Carrie. That was a great job on your presentation. Um, I'm curious, what is your current institution practice? You mentioned being um, part of a trial right now, um, the most trial, I believe you mentioned, but what is your current practice in terms of these agents? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so currently we are enrolling patients in this trial. I'm not entirely certain as to how many we have, how many patients have participated in this trial, um, but a lot of patients, so this trial did focus specifically on IV um, tyrophiban. However, it is also used as catheter directed or intraarterial. Um, so we do have patients who receive it in that way. But from my knowledge, um, based on my discussions with our team, we are not currently using the tyrophiban in our patients for IV. And I guess as a follow-up, um, Gabe had a question, is there a parenteral antiplatelet agent that you think would be beneficial um, for this indication based on PKPD data? Um, that is a good question. Um, so I think it would, I think your patient would play a role into making that determination. Um, I know that I guess the tyrophiban, it does have, you know, the way that the mechanism works, it does stop the platelet aggregation. Um, so that could be beneficial. But as far as looking for an IV platelet, antiplatelet agent, um, maybe there's the canker lore or something that we could use instead. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, I don't know that there, this is a game that there is an answer to that question. I, I was just wondering, you know, each drug company is gonna obviously push their own IV antiplatelet for this indication, but I'm just wondering, you know, taking a step back based on your experience and you, you're a mini expert in this field, given all the background reading you've done, is there one agent where uh, a study may be, uh, may prove to be more beneficial than others just based on that PKPD data? And, like I said, I don't know that there is an answer for this question. Yeah, um, I think specifically in this patient population with the literature that I read on acute ischemic stroke and using it, I think if I had to select between the three different agents in the class that I would potentially lean more towards the tyrophiban, um, I would probably lean away from the abseximab. There is a lot of really great data in PCI, um, but from my experience, the data in acute ischemic stroke is not promising. Um, and just because the eptifibotide isn't available readily in the US, I'd probably lean away from that one as well. But I think you're right, I don't think there's a great answer for that as of yet. Excellent, thanks so much, Carrie. Are there other questions for Carrie? I don't see anything else in the chat at the moment. 
Okay, well, if not, it is right at the hour. So we will conclude this session of the Neurocritical Care Pharmacy Journal Club. And thank you everyone for joining us.